Um, it is 11.02 actually, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and what we're doing now is uh, reconvening and we're uh, uh, returning to the agenda item uh, five, I believe, and it's uh, memorandum 2021-6, the recodification of toxic substance uh, statutes. And Kristen, this is your memo. Do you wanna go ahead and take us through it? Yes, thank you. So good morning, commissioners. Um, I'll actually take up the first two memos together. So memorandum 2021-6 and 2021-7 present draft final recommendations for the commission's uh, recodification of chapter 6.8 of division 20 of the health and safety code and then the associated conforming revisions that are needed to update all the cross references um, to those provisions. So at the prior meetings, the commission has been considering comments on the main re uh, recodification and making changes. This, the draft that's presented with uh, memorandum six includes all of those changes and addresses a few more issues that are flagged in the memo. Um, we don't need to discuss them. The, both these memos are proposed consent, so we don't have to talk about the individual issues unless commissioners would like to. I do need a final uh, vote to approve both of these as final recommendations. The one thing that I do wanna note is with regard to timing. So the tentative recommendations were prepared last year. These uh, draft finals reflect all the legislative changes that were made in 2020. Only the conforming revisions uh, legislation was affected. So there were just a few provisions that we updated, but we will not be seeking implementing legislation for this proposal this year. So this would be implemented in 2022. We've made some minor adjustments to reflect that, but we will also of course then need to make sure we incorporate any legislative changes that happen this year, which we will do. And if the, they need the commission's attention, we'll bring them back um, at that point. So otherwise, unless there are questions from the commissioners or anything that you wanna discuss in either of those memos, um, you're welcome to just take a vote on the approval of those. I move the approval. Second. Very good. All right, all those in favor? Aye. It's all of us again, huh? Okay, good. Good. And so you have the approval, Kristen, to go forward. Thank you. And so there's actually the, the last memo that I have um, is about the next piece of this study, which is chapter 6.5. And the commission considered an initial memorandum back in the middle of 2020 when we were waiting comment um, on our tentative recommendations and approved a, an outline for the, that material. But there's been an organizational issue that's come up a few times that the staff felt it might be helpful to sort of put the cards out on the table and offer people an opportunity to weigh in on. That memo is entirely informational. The, the fundamental question is whether or not we sort of keep the material in chapter 6.5 as a whole or break it into pieces. And essentially the staff sees some very practical reasons for keeping it together. And we're not sure whether or not there might be good reasons for breaking it apart. And we just wanna open up that discussion because if there are making that call now, would be a lot easier than, than having to make those adjustments later on. So unless commissioners wanna talk about that, like I said, that's an informational memo and really just a prompt for, for public comment. And that's, that's all I've got to talk about today. Any questions? No, no, oh, uh, Commissioner Simpson? No, I was just gonna say, I, I, think your, I think your conclusion about keeping it all in the same bucket uh, in terms of potentially unintended substantive effects of that, I think is, is well taken. So I, I think your inclination is correct. Yeah, so uh, like I said, it's very easy for the, the staff to see those costs because we're gonna be doing a lot of those updates and the commission is gonna have to make those decisions and walking through, there are quite a few situations in the codes. And not only that, but I expect that those are also gonna be in the regs and will impose costs on the state agencies that need to you know, adopt adjustments. But um, it may well be that there are some reasons out there that the staff isn't aware of that people really feel that there would be a big benefit to doing this. So hopefully if there are, we'll, we'll hear about those. Nope. No, I think it's a point well made, especially in a great bridge to agenda item number six, because that's where we see some changes that we made that we didn't, you know, again, that we're not aware. This has been a good month or this meeting because it's like catching all the things that we just that we didn't catch before. So this is good. Yeah. Good way to start the year out. All right. So with that said, Barbara, on um, we're on agenda item number six, which is 
statute made obsolete by trial restructuring, trial court restructuring part eight, uh, study J1407. Okay, um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, there are two um, memos that relate to the first part of this uh, discussion, or at least a memo and a supplement. Um, it's memorandum 21, uh, 20 2021-9 and a supplement that was released yesterday. I hope everybody got that supplement. Um, last November, the commission began re-examining the statutes on judicial benefits that it set aside for further study uh, after circulating its voluminous 2001 tentative recommendation on uh, statutes made obsolete by trial court restructuring. Um, this memo continues that process. Uh, it examines four different uh, code sections um, and it takes them uh, starting with uh, government code section 69894.4, then section 69894.3, and then uh, section 53200.3, and finally section 53214.5. Um, I started with 69894.3.4 uh, uh, in part because I thought that would be the easiest of the four, um, it, it turns out that that one is, is also a, a bit challenging uh, and none of the four are uh, easy in, in um, despite all the work that I've done on trial court restructuring over the years. Um, these are some of the hardest ones and the ones that uh, I find um, most difficult to make a clear recommendation to the commission on how to handle them. Uh, particularly, uh, they, they involve um, issues that are very important to the courts and to court staff, uh, sensitive issues. Um, and they also involve uh, factual questions that I just don't know the answers to. Um, and so I have been trying hard to reach out to the courts and people in that world to, um, to learn more about the, the situation. And we've been fortunate to uh, be starting to get some input in response. Um, I believe we have a, a number of people participating uh, in, the, um, dis, uh, in the Zoom call today uh, who are interested in this topic. Uh, we've got a, a letter from uh, the Los Angeles County Superior Court um, and also one on behalf of the Superior Court in San Bernardino County. Um, we really appreciate that input. Um, it's a hard time for the courts in general right now and, and to be getting input on, on this topic is, is really something that I think we should be very grateful for, but I think these issues are important enough that, that it is uh, necessary to, to try and find out what the courts think about them before taking any action on them. Um, if I uh, am correct, um, participating in the call today is uh, Crystal Lyons who is the general counsel and the director of legal services for um, San Bernardino County Superior Court. Um, I, I'm also aware that uh, Gary McBride um, from the County of San Bernardino, he's their strategic projects director, uh, was planning to be on this call. He's on Barbara and he has his hand up too now. Just wanted, the chair just wants to go okay. on. Go ahead. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure whether anybody else is here for this particular topic, but, but I, I, I am aware of those two people who were planning to participate. Um, so um, I would like to start with section 69894.3 uh, and section 69894.4. Uh, I put those together in one category because um, both of them apply to a county with a population 
that exceeds 2 million people. Um, and there is uh, ambiguity uh, as to what that means uh, with, with the respect to these particular uh, code sections because um, the code sections do not specify how to determine whether the population exceeds 2 million people. Um, and so, uh, and uh, the population figures for California counties have varied over time. So when these provisions were first enacted, uh, they only applied to in Los Angeles County. That was the only county in the state that had a population over 2 million people. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, there are at least five and possibly six counties, and they're um, listed in the memo, that have a population over 2 million people. Um, we did the, the commission staff, uh, a former attorney, uh, Lynn, Lynn Ehrman, um, did some research back in 2001 about how to uh, interpret a statute that refers to a county with a particular population size, but doesn't, um, doesn't specify a, you know, a census or other means of uh, determining the population. Uh, and came, she came to the conclusion, um, and that's explained in the supplement to the, today's memo, uh, she came to the conclusion that um, if the statute doesn't specify how to determine the population that you should use the uh, latest federal census for that purpose. Um, and so that would mean that uh, Section 69894.3 and 69894.4 now apply to um, at least five counties. And you know, when we get the results from the 2020 census, then we will um, know that that uh, whether whether there's six counties that potentially are governed by these code sections or not. Um, I think it's important in dealing with uh, these code sections to bear in mind that um, what the legislature originally intended to do uh, with respect to uh, how, uh, how deciding how, how whether, whether these statutes apply to a particular county um, is not really the thing that matters most right now. What matters most right now is whether it makes sense for these particular statutes to apply in uh, a particular county today. Um, so I don't really have more to say about that point right now, um, just that I think it's something to bear in mind as we go forward and decide how to handle um, section 69894.3 and section 69894.4. Um, is, is there anybody who wants to speak up on that point right now? Okay, um, then section 69894.4 is the provision that relates to uh, travel expenses of judges and, and other court employees. And it's shown at the top of page five of the memo. And some of the language in it is pretty clearly obsolete. Like it refers to all of the employees provided for in section 69894.1, um, but section 69894.1 has been repealed. And there's also another reference to that repealed uh, code section later in, in section 69894.4. Um, it also refers to, um, at, at, and there's a sentence that says, any expenses for travel outside of the county uh, shall require the prior, prior approval of the board of the supervisors. Um, that kind of requirement made sense uh, in the past 
when uh, courts received uh, county funding and were county operated. Um, but today, the, the courts are no longer county operated. And so having the Board of Supervisors uh, have control over decisions like that um, is, is no longer um, makes sense. Um, and there are other references in uh, section 69894.4 to um, payment by the county and decisions uh, being made by the county. Um, so there, there's clearly language in this, this code section that does not reflect the um, current conditions in the court system. Um, when the, the commission proposed to repeal section 69894.4 uh, in 2001, Los Angeles County Superior Court uh, objected um, and said that uh, the part of the provision pertaining to assignment of an automobile uh, should be retained because the newly enacted uh, code provision that dealt with travel expenses of and reimbursement of uh, court employees for, for travel um, did not adequately address the assignment of an automobile. And um, that the, the commission just pulled the provision from its proposal at the time and didn't really uh, go forward in, with uh, the matter. And, and it's waiting now for us to, to figure out how to handle it. Um, in terms of, there, there is a code provision that was newly enacted at, in 2001, I believe it was six, it, it's a government code section 69505 that, that uh, seems to supersede um, much of what section 69894.4 says about travel expenses. Uh, that provision does apply notwithstanding it any other provision to the contrary. So it would prevail over any contrary language that um, might be in section 69894.4. Um, so, there, so there can't really be a, a clear conflict between the two provisions because the language, the notwithstanding language in, in 69894.4 uh, takes care of that and says which one prevails. Um, at this point, um, LA County Superior Court has again informed the commission that it would uh, oppose repealing this code provision. Uh, LA County Superior Court's comment does not make clear what its position would be on something less than a complete repeal of this code section. Um, and if there is anybody from the court here to speak to that, it would be very helpful to know uh, how they feel about it. Um, in comments from San Bernardino County Superior Court, um, they would not object to repeal of this particular code section. So, um, that is what we know at this point about um, positions that uh, the courts have taken on this one. Um, and I am eager to hear what anybody thinks about it, including in particular, uh, anybody who's here in the audience uh, who has anything to add. And I should, should also um, make clear that we, you know, we have worked hard to uh, reach out to people um, about this, these issues. Now, there may not have been enough time for stakeholders to weigh in and to be aware of the study. And in some instances, I don't have good contact information 
for uh, the courts and the counties. And so um, it may be necessary, uh, depending on, on how this discussion goes, it may be necessary with regard to this provision or some of the others to give more time for uh, stakeholders to weigh in and, and not to, I mean, we our, our study process is, is of course uh, long and, and there will be ample time for, for people to weigh in at later stages, but even for purposes of making a preliminary decision, um, it may be too soon to uh, make preliminary decisions. So with that, I, I'm eager to hear if anybody has anything to say about uh, 69894.4. Um, I do not, I, I see Gary McBride's hand up, but I'm not sure on if, Gary, if you're there and you want to weigh in on this discussion right now, um, can you, I guess this would be your time now to speak. Brian, do you want to unmute him? He's enabled to speak now, but it needs to unmute himself. Mr. McBride, if you can. Probably need Okay, to how about now? Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you, thank you. Oh, perfect, all right, thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments. Uh, just, uh, I wanna be clear that the county does concur with the written comments that were provided by the San Bernardino Superior Court. We've had conversations uh, between the administrative office and the court executive office and, uh, and we agree. Um, I did wanna to touch on, I'm jumping just a little bit ahead, but rather than interrupt you a second time with my comments later, if I could just jump ahead to the judicial benefits as well. Um, we do still have uh, a relationship with the courts where we provide judicial benefits for um, a, a discrete group of judges that were hired prior to a specific date. And so we still do need that judicial benefit language that's in uh, the point three section, um, but that will phase out over time. Um, and so it's certainly something that we would be supportive of the commission revision in the, revisiting in the future, but we, we do need those provisions at the moment. Um, so with that, I don't have any other comments. Thank you very much for seeking our input and we, we appreciate the ability to participate. Crystal, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. McBride. I just wanted to also acknowledge uh, Crystal Lyons. She has her hand up too. We're gonna bring, uh, Brian, you're gonna bring her to, yeah, there you go. And then Ms. Lyons, you just have to unmute yourself. Okay, good. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, I don't have much to add. I would echo what Mr. McBride said. We did work collaboratively in exploring and evaluating the impact of these particular code sections. So I just wanted to chime in and say that um, I agree with him wholeheartedly. We don't have any objections to the other three sections as it relates to the judicial officers. We agree that they need to stay intact because they are implementing sections that work um, in coordination with the Trial Court Employment Protection and Governance Act. But with respect to the parts of those statutes that deal with employee benefits, we don't rely on those statutes with respect to um, administering our employee benefits. So that part, as I indicated in our response, we have no objection to. And with respect to the travel expenses, we rely on the uh, judicial branch contracting manual and the FIN code as indicated in the memo that the staff submitted. So again, we, we, it wouldn't impact our court. I'm, obviously I can't speak for other courts, but um, with respect to the county and with uh, the Superior Court for San Bernardino, that's, that's the uh, feedback that we just wanted to offer. And, and again, thank you very much for providing us with an opportunity to, to share the impacts that it would have on our court. Thank you for being here though. The, the comment and your participation is invaluable. Um, let's see, do we have anyone else from the audience that might wanna also weigh in? Okay, um, just if you two can stay and then just kind of listen and track what we say and feel comfortable to join in uh, and just raise your hand as, as if, if needed, don't hesitate on that. We'll go ahead and Barbara, do you wanna to go, to we'll go to the next topic? Okay, so, well, so I think it, you know, at this point, 
um, the commission should perhaps make a decision about does it want to, as a preliminary matter, for purposes of uh, incorporating into a draft of a tentative recommendation, would it want to propose to repeal section 69894.4? Would it prefer to propose to um, revise section 69894.4 to remove all of the parts of it, except for the part about assignment of an automobile. And with respect to that, uh, do as what Judge Baskew from LA County Superior Court suggested uh, back in 2002, which was to substitute the court as the entity determining whether an automobile uh, should be uh, assigned uh, in lieu of uh, um, reimbursing somebody. Uh, for uh, use of an automobile. Um, or, you know, you could uh, include in a tentative recommendation, you could simply, we have done this in the past, um, simply include the uh, provision in the tentative recommendation without proposing any change and uh, include a note that solicits comment on it. Um, that's another option. Uh, other possibilities would be to decide right now that this one should be completely left alone because LA County Superior Court um, might have concerns about any revisions uh, that were might be made to it. Um, or you might um, want to defer decision on this, uh, e even as a preliminary matter, um, to give more time for people to weigh in. So I think those are some of your options and uh, you need to figure out among yourselves how, how you wanna proceed on this one. Okay, Barbara did not make it easy for us. She gave us a whole category of options. Uh, Commissioner Simpson. Uh, my inclination, I, I'd honestly wanna find out what LA County thinks about it now. It's been 20 years or so since we, almost 20 years since we heard from them. And if, as no, you no, say- no. Actually, we have heard from them. That's in, in, in the supplement um, oh, okay. that- and that we did a letter. Okay, and they wanted to yeah. keep it? They, they, they want to, they would object to okay. repealing it. It's how it is phrased in the supplement. Um, okay. and what they, and let me, let me quote from it because I, I think it is important to be precise about what they said and what they said regarding section 69894.4 is that they would oppose the repeal of it because existing judicial council policy provides insufficient clarity regarding the assignment of automobiles and the court currently relies upon the authority provided by government code section 69894.4 for this purpose. Mm. So they, they focus on the part of the provision that relates to assignment of automobiles, but they don't say what their view is on doing anything else to section 69894.4. And, you know, we could, I mean, another thing would be to ask the court to provide further input on that point. I think we've been lucky to get input from them at all, um, given current circumstances. So uh, it's, it's up to you to decide how to, how to proceed in light of what they've said. Thank you. Um, I do think uh, the whole goal was to try to make changes that basically streamline the statutes. And so, you know, we we just we touch on things that are substantive without, you know, with the, with the, without those intentions. Um, and this the feedback that we've gotten for uh, for today's meeting you know, it's, it's highlighting issues that are substantive. So um, it would be my 
vote to just say that we um, that we don't touch it and that we just create a signpost requesting um, public comment. And then that will help to move the study along and then allow our resources to focus on other uh, sections. And then we see what kind of comment comes, I guess, within the next 90 days. Well, I, I mean, you, you could, we could come back to this before preparing a draft and see what comment comes. Um, that's one possibility. Another possibility is to include it in a tentative recommendation without proposing specific revisions and then include a note that solicits comment. Um, and that's that's that was my proposal with the signpost, but that is exactly what I think it, it helps to move things along and then it would help to solicit um, review because it's in a tentative recommendation. Um, but what are the other commissioner's thoughts? Commissioner Carrillo, I see your face kind of. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I was going to ask Barbara. Oh, you're back on mute. David. Barbara, it seems like the only remaining objection is from LA Superior and reading their letter, they don't go into detail about what their objection to point four is. It just says existing judicial council policy provides insufficient clarity regarding assignment of automobiles. But it seems like from your memo, you feel like um, point four is, is obsolete. So I, I, don't under, I don't understand what, what LA's objection is or why they think it's not obsolete. I, you know, they have not provided detail on that. So um, that, that being the case, I, I agree with Crystal. I, I, I think, you know, why don't we put it in a tentative recommendation that kind of puts, a, puts it to them. You know, like if, if you have an actual rationale for why this is not obsolete, then, then tell us. And otherwise we'll move forward with, with deleting it because it looks to us like it's obsolete. Uh, Simpson, or, or I'm sorry, Commissioner Simpson, did you have, okay. And then Victor, did you have any, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Rick. No, I, 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 I agree with David. I think we, we need to find out specifically what they think is still necessary in there. And I haven't heard it. Yeah, you know, I was hoping that, that we have, we have um, 12 attendees. So I was kind of hoping that somebody would, and there's no one from the courts on the call, it's okay. Okay, Jane, you guys were okay. Anna, good. Victor, okay. Uh, I, I'm fine with um, what David's suggesting to push it out. We'll push it out through the form of a tentative recommendation, Barbara. And, right. And just so I'm I'm clear on this, I th I think um, the the chair was suggesting putting it in a tentative recommendation without proposing any particular revisions. Um, oh, no. And, yeah. and, and, and I think Commissioner Carrillo might be suggesting instead putting it in the tentative recommendation and proposing to repeal it. Um, those are two different approaches. <laughs> and so uh, I think you, you need to be clear. My, my rationale is that, you know, there's 58 counties and only one out of those 58 is raising an objection and they didn't even bother to explain it. So, you know, that's, that's 99% of the county courts are fine with us deleting this. Well, so, so I would make that the proposal and then leave it to LA to justify why we shouldn't do that. It, it's not that 99 have said, or 99% have said, you know, we love it. It's that we haven't heard from them. True. Well, and, and also that, this particular provision only applies in counties with a population over 2 million. So, so really you're not talking about 58 courts or counties, you're talking about five. The Orange County, yeah, well. she listed. But I mean, we just haven't heard from them. And like, uh, like she mentioned too, with COVID, LA County is pretty much, you know, reporting and working. I, we have two people from San Bernardino County um, San Diego County, Riverside, Orange County, Santa Clara, I'm not sure what's happening there. I think giving more time and you can do that by just leaving the statute intact and, re and request. But I mean, David's proposal is good because it helps to say, if we don't hear from you, we're gonna clean it up and make it obsolete. So oh, I don't I know, you guys have to be sorry. Can I add weigh in on this? 
LA County being the biggest one, the biggest superior court, I think it's worth it to wait to get clarification from them. Uh, even though they may not have provided specificity now, I think it'd be a mistake not to um, get more clarification. I would love to hear that, yeah. Yeah. Well, and if we put it in a tentative recommendation without proposing a specific reform, we could still, in, a, in the accompanying note soliciting comments, we could you know, specifically ask, what is it about the language that's in this provision about assignment of automobiles that is still pertinent and important? Um, why, why do you consider it necessary to um, keep that language? But, but Barbara, I do like your, your suggestion where we change the language so that we make the discretion uh, shift to the court. And that way we give deference to LA County and whatever they have going on. Maybe there's a political issue with you know, the presiding judge that the person who did speak didn't want to identify what the issue is. Um, I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, and so that, that also combines David's suggestion, which is very, it helps you to proceed. It helps the commission to proceed because it, it proposes changes. It addresses things that are obsolete and it sets it in front of everyone squarely within a tentative recommendation. And we solicit comment. And if we you know, don't hear anything further, then we move on or we adopt it, you know, possibly adopt the tentative recommendation as is. Any comments, you guys, on that? Well, then it sounds maybe like, do we need to just leave it alone, let it sit there and wait to see what happens and then make recommendations? Because we're, then we would come back on what would be the change. Okay. So then oh, go, go ahead. Well, my only question is, if, if, we, if we're not proposing any changes to it, uh, is anybody going to be inclined to... Um, to want to speak to it because their presumption is that if we go forward and accept our tentative recommendation, we're not making any changes. I thought I was saying that you know, we should like maybe do what Barbara was suggesting. We, we need a way to flag it for LA County that absent some explanation from them as to why they think 0.4 should stay, it looks like it's obsolete to us. And so if we don't hear anything that changes that opinion, we're going to delete it because it's obsolete. But, but I do think it's not obsolete entirely. If we, if we do change or if we revise it so that the courts have to make their own decision without, with it, you know, about personal autos, whatever the issue is, if they provide vehicles, if they're doing whatever they're doing with their expense report on that particular part. If we make it a court decision, then they can change it and do whatever they want. And then there's support for it in the statute. Jane. The, the issue appears to me that we just have to have some way to have LA County respond to us in a timely manner because it just drags on, right? So, I mean, I think that's the, that's the import here. Barbara, is there, do you have any kind of um, contact that, that in terms of requesting clarification on this particular point so that uh, to make this this particular point get addressed without having to just you know do this whole convoluted you know force you by issuing a tentative recommendation et cetera et cetera. I mean, is there other is there some other mechanism we can use or contact that we can use so that we can affect this maybe in a in a more expeditious manner and maybe in not a you know confrontational manner, but but get the yeah, information. I, I, I do have some um, contacts uh, at LA County Superior Court. Um, who have been helpful in, in uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate, I think, to have gotten the letter from them uh, in time for this meeting that, you know, carefully, it, it, maybe they don't answer all the questions we have, but they did provide us with a letter explaining that they still consider the provision uh, important uh, in, in some respects. Um, I think that if I tap into those contacts and say that the commission 
would like further information specifically addressing, you know, could we perhaps uh, revise the statute to only include the language about automobiles and to explain to us why the language about automobiles is important. Um, I, I think if I ask them to provide further information that they're likely to be cooperative and um, maybe the best thing to do would be to uh, just put this over to the next meeting or whenever I can get uh, input further input and bring it back and, and we can discuss it further. Maybe give you a couple of uh, my contacts, Barbara. I think I have before, but I don't think they pan out. And I can just say, I think they're, it's, it's really bureaucratic. So if you have someone who's paying attention and listening and writing, uh, that's, or whoever's in your circle of contacts, uh, <laughs> that's a good start, I think. Um, and then I'll just share with you whatever I can find on that from my end. And if they're they're helpful, then maybe you just kind of put out a couple of feelers and maybe you'll hear something. But um, that's not a bad suggestion either. We just put it over to the next. My, my suggestion would be that, you know, once you reach out, why don't I, I think whether this requires a formal motion or not, why don't why don't we, you know, we're going to put it over to the next meeting and you can communicate to, to whoever it is that you are are dealing with on this particular issue that we're going to list it as an agenda item specifically addressing their issue if they can and have someone who will appear now it's really not that difficult because they don't have to travel, right? They can do it virtually. Then we can request that someone appear and speak to us on this particular topic in the next meeting, and we can try to just wrap it up, you know? And, and move that item so that they can speak, you know, at a certain time that works for them and Whatever. make it just very effective. Yeah, I agree. Try that first, maybe. I can, I can, I can give it a try and, um, you know, what we can see how that goes. Um, I, I think if, if I tell them that the, the commission really would like to have someone from the court participate in a discussion of these provisions that um, they're likely to be responsive. And, and we can, um, I can, I can talk with the chair offline about, um, about her context within the court. I, I think- I'll email you. I, I'm yeah, but I, I think I'm pretty well tapped in as far as LA Superior goes. Okay. So, um, so 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 I think we've kind of taken care of that one for today's purposes, unless anybody else has something to add. Um, section six nine eight nine four point four is the next one. Um, it's perhaps the hardest one of all. Um, but because it, because it covers a lot of ground, uh, you, you can see it on, on page eight of the memo is, is the text of section 69894.4. I guess it spills over onto page nine as well. Um, it deals with a, a lot of different topics. The two of those topics are judicial benefits and benefits of jurors and kind of shortcutting the discussion um, we've talked before about uh, judicial benefits and about how the trial court employment protection and governance act uh, does not uh, cover judges. It, it, it also does not cover jurors. And because neither of those uh, um, court personnel are covered by the trial court employment protection and governance act, uh, there is no, uh, the, the parts of section 69894.3 that pertain to jurors and to judges uh, uh, appear to still be necessary. And in fact, this is the statute that the um, Court of Appeal uh, re referred to, one of them that the Court of Appeal to, referred to in the Sturgeon line of cases uh, about supplemental judicial benefits. Um, and uh, of course here, the, the commission is only concerned with uh, material that's in, in the statute that's been made obsolete by trial court restructuring. Um, 
it doesn't have any authority to weigh the merits of supplemental judicial benefits. But at this point, with regard to uh, the parts of the statute that relate to jurors and to judges, uh, I, I think it'd be helpful to get a preliminary read from the commission about whether you're uh, comfortable with uh, leaving those alone. Victor, okay, all of us in favor say aye. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Carillo, are you there? Are you just step out? Okay, so he's absent. So we can record what, four in favor, five in favor. Um, quick question. Should, should you we- You didn't vote. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, no, should, um, should we make some, this is kind of back on the, one of the early things that, that Barbara mentioned about uh, counties with populations over 2 million. Um, are we making a presumption going forward that this applies to any county with a current population over 2 million? Or as I presume the legislature um, uh, thought when they enacted it was that it only applied to LA. Do we, should we make any sort of um, um, I don't know, inquiry or, or, I mean, I, I, I I'm, I'm aware of the, the, the memo you, you uh, mentioned, Barbara, about someone, well, a legal analysis of this would probably conclude that um, it ought to be applicable in a county with the most recent, you know, census over 2 million, which may make it five counties. Is that what the, you know, is that what this statute's intended to apply to? Because um, my assumption was when it was written, it was written for LA, and that um, that whatever is is in there is, is was intended to be applicable to LA because LA was special or different or something like that. So I I'm a little unclear as to what our presumption is going forward if we sort of leave it intact. Well, one one thing that we could do that we have not done uh, yet is that uh, there, there might be material at state archives relating to the, um, to, to how to interpret uh, section 69894.3 uh, when it was originally enacted. Um, and they, they, are, they can be extremely helpful at state archives in, in doing that sort of research um, if you call them up and you give them a uh, statute year and chapter number, they will do research, but I don't know how that works during the pandemic. Right. Um, no, but I guess, I guess, sort of my, my assumption is this was enacted, was this one of the ones in 1959 or whatever it was that was, whenever that, whenever that was. But I, 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 Whenever, but when, when it, was it was enacted in about that time frame, yeah. not I, I think it was not exactly the same time, but it was, you know, it was it was part of that group that it's in the same article yeah. Yeah. as as the ones that were um, either amended or originally drafted to refer to a particular census or a particular class um, of county. And this one does not. And, you know, that was part of what the, our, our former staff attorney, Lynn Ehrman was uh, using in her analysis was the fact that this one doesn't refer to a way to calculate the population. And therefore right. you can draw the inference that um, that the legislature did that deliberately. You can also, you know, ju just as easily um, infer that perhaps the legislature didn't think about it in this particular uh, instance. If, if I might, um, and just so that everyone knows too, that LA County is the largest court system if I'm, I'm in the world. So, that is part of it's not so much that oh those are all, where all the movie stars are the system is huge so other other courts look to what's happening in LA as for guidance so it, it impacts multiple jurisdictions outside of even the state all right 
No, my, I guess my question is, do, do we know one way or the other whether San Diego, um, Santa Clara, uh, Riverside, the other large counties believe this applies to them and they, they're, they have to follow it? That's, that's not entirely clear to me. Um, that's, you know, that's the kind of input that I think would be really helpful to us that yeah. we haven't gotten yet. Um, San Bernardino has, has come through in, and that's in part because I had good contact information for San Bernardino and they've been extremely cooperative and helpful. Um, for the other courts, I don't have um, as solid contact information, but I, I know how to get it. Okay. And if we give this more time, we may be able to get yeah. input from some of the other courts as well. Okay. All right. Now, I think that would I think that would be helpful. I mean, knowing whether this is intended to be applied to only LA County, um, and whether or not other other large counties would be surprised to find out that this may well apply to them too. I think we need to know that. Yeah. So so I will you know, keep uh, seeking input on that point. Um, did we get a, a, a decision on um, the jurors and the judges? Was everybody in agreement that the parts of section 69894.3 pertaining to jurors and judges need to stay in? I think it should stay in based on the comment that we just uh, recently received. But do we want, are we tabling it? Is that what your suggestion is, Rick, or what? Well, um, no, I'm fine keeping it. Um, and I think Barbara's rationale were, was right. I just, I'm, I'm curious as to whether um, other large counties um, think it applies to them. Yeah, well, and I think that's a separate question. Because we're 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 taking we're not we're taking six nine eight nine four point three and and figuring out how to deal with it in pieces at this point. Yes. So so with regard to you know its scope, which counties it applies to, that's one question. Um, and I think at this point we're not ready to decide that question. Um, where our decision is, or your decision is that we need to get more input still before we decide that question. Um, and then with regard to keeping the parts of the provision that, uh, keeping the parts of section 69894.3 that pertain to jurors and to judges, I think what I'm hearing from the commission is that you want to, um, as a preliminary decision, uh, that those parts of the statute should be left intact. Yes. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. You have a okay. consensus. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And I don't see any comments so, from the from my our attendees. Yeah. So the hard part then of of that. Um, of section 69894.3 is what to do about the provisions that relate to court employees. And what we've heard so far uh, from LA County Superior Court is that those provisions are still important. We need to keep the, basically keep the entire statute in place. Um, and I, I could read what they have to say, but it's, it's rather long. It is, it is in the supplement, um, but they are, they are well, I'll just read it because it, it may be helpful to hear again. Uh, the court agrees with this. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. This is, this is San Bernardino County. Um, and so first, Section 69894.3, LA County Superior Court would oppose the repeal of the section. The court currently relies upon the authorities provided by um, the section in several ways. Um, and 
first is that it remains crucial for the purposes of juror management. We've already dealt with that. Uh, second, the court routinely cites section 69894.3 as necessary authority, complementing the trial court employment protection and governance act in transactions involving trial court staff transfers. So they're saying that, that, that they still rely on the parts of section 69894.3 that relate to uh, 69894.3 that relate to, to transferring uh, court staff. Um, then it also says that the court relies on the, the authority provided in this section 69894.3 in contracting for the court's participation in county benefit plans, including deferred compensation plans. Uh, this participation greatly increases the cost effectiveness of trial court employee benefits and reflects the legislature's intent in, in passing the Lockyer-Eisenberg Trial Court Funding Act in 1997 to, to allow court employees to retain access to local benefits provided to county employees. Government code section 69894.3 remains a necessary authority for this purpose. So LA County Superior Court is, is being very clear on, on, they think that the parts of the provision relating to court employees are still necessary for their purposes. Um, San Bernardino County Superior Court uh, said that um, they would not object to um, the, the commission determining that the parts relating to employee benefits and employee transfer rights are obsolete because um, they do not rely on section 69894.3 for those purposes. They rely solely on the provisions in the Trial Court Employment Protection and Governance Act. So that's where we stand in terms of input on court employees. And again, you know, it would be nice to hear from the other courts that are potentially affected by this. Um, I can keep drumming up input on it. Um, if, if you feel comfortable to, to make some kind of decision at this point regarding a tentative recommendation, um, you know, you, you, you could do that also, but um, it, it perhaps would be best to, to keep trying to get further input before the commission decides what to do on this one. Great. Um, I don't want to be a broken record, but I, I'm having kind of a chicken and egg um, issue with this. Um, if this section only applies to LA County, we don't need to hear from San Bernardino and Riverside and Santa Clara because they don't believe that they're affected by it in the first place. So uh, th that's where I'm a little at a, at a loss as to, we ought to figure out whether we care what the other large counties, because this is intended only to apply to LA. And if, 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 that's, if that's the really what this section is all about, and it was intended to be in only apply to LA County, then then LA County's views on this ought to uh, be given a whole lot more weight. So I'm, um, as I say, sorry to be a broken record, but um, my my assumption is when the legislature wrote this back there, this was how they intended it only to apply to LA County by putting the population. They didn't put a census, as you say, but but this was intended to be an LA only provision. And that's why the other counties really don't care. So that's my chicken and egg uh, conundrum. And I don't know what to, I mean, yeah, we ought to, we ought, I, I, I'm okay hearing about it, hearing from the other counties, but I don't know whether we ought to give them much weight because the legislature, when they wrote the statute, didn't have, didn't intend for it to apply to anybody outside of LA in the first place. 
I think we should give deference to LA County. Um, and thank you, Rick, um, because that's a good point. But it, I do think we should give deference. They were clear on this. On the other, um, with the person or with the automobile expenses, that didn't make sense. But for in terms of employee, or it didn't make it did not make sense. It's just that they weren't very clear on what their uh, recommendation would be or not. Um, other than they didn't support re it being repealed. But um, here it is clear, it applies. And I think we did hear from Crystal Lyons and then we heard from Gary McBride that this is an issue and that they're both from San Bernardino. So it's, I just think we need to not touch it. Our goal is not to strip and change the law. It is to streamline it and make it you know, efficient. So uh, in, in commenting or rephrasing or revising sections that actually mean something to people who are working with this, that, that's, I think that steps outside of what our goal is as a, as a commission. Um, I just think we don't need to touch it. Um, and it's not so much that it's only because it impacts either LA or Orange County. It's just, if people are working with it, we need to not touch it. That's just my recommendation or my opinion. Jane? I, I do think that Barbara's suggestion about trying to go back and determine, you know, in the archives about the legislative intent, because I want to be sure that we're not misinterpreting the population issue. And, you know, that, that maybe it was intended to be not just LA, but to be all the counties that were, I mean, we, I think, it, you know, it, it, it speaks to what we do in our mission, which is making sure that we understand what the legislative intent is and what the, the premise is for all of these things before we go and try and, you know, do the work that, you know, let's make sure we're doing the correct work, I guess. So I think it merits more investigation. I don't know how hard it will be to do that, Barbara, but I think that was an excellent suggestion. I'd like to see that happen first and then have the, um, I mean, not necessarily first, it can happen in tandem, whatever. But I, I think it's a necessary component, um, in my opinion, because we need more information, I think. No, Anna's nodding her head and you have Rick nodding his, Victor, David, I don't know. They're both nodding. Okay. Or David staring. <laughs> so I just, you know what, honestly, and I only say this and, and because I love Barbara, but she is very detailed and honestly, she, she'll look and she'll look, but I do think that, you know, sometimes we, she spends a lot of time on topics and if she's presenting it, then we do have to make a decision as opposed to sending her back to look because I mean, she'll look, but we, I think we have enough information now. We have enough. She's laughing. Uh, and hopefully she's are, not are taking we, offense to it. But Barbara, you know, you will look. And, and, yeah, and I, I love it. But the, the, the reason I'm supportive of Barbara looking is, are we aware of any example where people made this 2,000, 2 million person cut off and just presumed it was LA? I mean, that's, that's kind of weird. Not that I'm a textual originalist, but, you know, 2 million is 2 million. They could have said LA. So... So it, it, it wor it's worth looking into. Well, Rick, can I actually speak, I think, to the 2 million, why they referred to 2 million rather than, than the county of LA. And I'm gonna let him do that because I think he can do it better than I can. Oh, no, well, it's, it's just, it, it, I, I think it's, it's the response to the uniformity requirement of statutes in the constitution that, that there are sort of special burden if you wanna- okay. You, you can't just pick out a county and say that one, right? So they're so they're they picked a a descriptor that okay. you know distinguishes and, and one county. To LA, but but you know in theory could apply. But but, but but we really don't know. So I'm all for Barbara looking. Yeah, that's fine. And, and we don't, we don't have a time crunch on this, uh, uh, right? Well, no, we, why we not don't. look? We and I think time is working for us, you guys, because of COVID. It's like it's giving more people an opportunity to weigh in. So if I'm I can sorry, Barbara, I interject. Off. So it sounds like, Barbara, you've got a consensus for the next step on that. Um, I just want to chime in and say that uh, we have a couple of people, at least in the audience, for the last agenda item. And our, our stated end time is 1230. So... I would like to ask for at least 15 minutes at the end of the meeting, if that works for you, Barbara. Uh, it, it does. And, you know, I, I think that the way this discussion has been going, um, 
I think that perhaps we come down to what I kind of uh, floated at the beginning of this discussion, which is perhaps we need to let some of this percolate a little bit more before we're ready to, to make decisions. And, and you know, it, it, it does mean that it'll be necessary to sort of bring all this back and, and, and that's, yes, that is more work, but we may be in a better position to uh, come up with good decisions if we give it more time for input and research and, um, and, and just take it a step further before you even make those preliminary decisions. So um, we could either, I think given the fact that we've got people here for the, the fish and game item, um, maybe it's better to just stop this discussion now and turn to that and um, do the best we can to bring this back in with more information in the future. Okay, and that deals with um, the your second memo, which was the judicial disqualification. Well, that one, that one, we could just we haven't even started the discussion. Maybe we could just uh, put that agenda on the um, put that put over put that okay. same memo over onto the next agenda. Um, there's no urgency to it. Um, I don't think it's necessary to write another memo on that. I think I've given you everything you need to, to make a decision, but in the interest of, of time management, I think it's better to just put that one over for next time. Okay, sounds good. All, all commissioners in favor? Okay, by consensus, we are, we're all there. Okay, good. All right, well then we'll go to, then we'll move the next item. Uh, move to the next item, which is the final one, number seven, which is fish and game law study R100. And I think that we have at least two people maybe from uh, that are in the audience or that are attendees. Okay, so Angela Donlin, uh, anyone else who wants to speak? If you can just raise your hand to be acknowledged. Wendy uh, Ogden, David Bess. I'll be honest, I Googled a little. So Julie Oltman too. <laughs> I just like to see who's here. All right. Um, okay, so for we'll go ahead and get started. And this is Brian's memo. Yeah, so this is memo 2021 um, 11, and it presents, it begins the presentation of public comment on the uh, fish and wildlife tentative recommendation that we circulated some time ago. Um, when this study began, we were tasked by the legislature with um, studying the fish and game code and making recommendations to improve its organization, clarify its meaning, resolve inconsistencies, eliminate unnecessary or obsolete provisions, standardize terminology, clarify program authority and funding sources and make other minor improvements. Um, it is a mostly non-substantive study. Uh, we're not to make any significant substantive changes in the course of our work on this. Um, and I, I think, well, I'll hold off on that. A little bit of history. Um, the commission spent a few years working its way through the Fish and Game Code, giving it close scrutiny, um, coming up with a proposed reorganization for the entire code and identifying uh, numerous cases where uh, minor improvements could be made to the, the language of the code. And, and I, I, here I'll, I'll pause and make a distinction between two broad classes of improvements, organizational improvements and non-organizational improvements. So in that long list of uh, tasks that I read out that the legislature assigned us, organizational improvements, um, it would involve creating the new code and moving everything around and breaking long sections into small pieces and creating new headings and structures for organizing and grouping similar provisions and separating dissimilar provisions, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the non-organizational improvements are the things like improving clarity, deleting obsolete provisions, um, eliminating unnecessary or obsolete, maybe I already said that, obsolete provisions, uh, and just generally making the law easier 
to read, understand, use without changing its organizational structure. Um, the reason that I'm drawing that distinction is that when we put together the tentative recommendation, it included everything. So it was a complete proposed reorganization, but there were notes after sections where we made other kinds of non-organizational changes, uh, drawing reviewer attention to them, asking specific questions about whether or not the changes we were proposing would be problematic. Um, so we were pretty, pretty cautious about changing language without including an, an accompanying note asking for that language to be examined and for the reviewers to let us know if, it, if there was any problem. Or in some cases, we just didn't know what to do and we asked for advice on what to do. Um, originally, following our normal practice, the expectation was that the comments would um, be on the tentative recommendation as a whole. This is the, the largest proposed law that I've seen in 20 plus years working for the commission. So it is a pretty monumental task for reviewers to look at the whole thing and give us feedback on everything. Um, and so the, the Fish and Wild, uh, Fish and Game Commission, Department of Fish and Wildlife had both uh, asked the commission to uh, slow down and extend the comment period and to bifurcate the comment into two pieces. Uh, phase one, is what we have now, which is comments on the specific notes that were in the tentative recommendation. So not commenting on the proposed reorganization or the changes to structure, but comments on the section level language issues. Is this obsolete? Is this redundant? Is Would this be a clearer way to express the law? Those kinds of things. Um, so that would be phase one. Phase two would be comments on the proposed organization and they were spaced out with a year in between. Uh, subsequent to that decision being made, the commission agreed uh, to that suggestion. Um, there were also suggestions about pushing the comment deadlines out, uh, in particular as a consequence of COVID, um, but also just in general, because the, the amount of work involved is, is significant. Um, the, both commenters let it, you know, in their letters to us talked about the resources that they'd had to commit and, you know, it's, it's um, notable in the Fish and Wildlife, Department of Fish and Wildlife letter, that they hired a former general counsel as a retired annuitant to work for a year exclusively on coordinating their, their uh, review of our notes. Um, so that is a senior counsel with, with decades of experience coordinating a team of other more junior attorneys and also operational, non-legal operational staff to go through and look at everything. Um, great amount of work. It illustrates the, the cost uh, to that agency that's involved in, in their part in this process. It's greatly appreciated, um, but I also think that it, it goes on one side of the scale in terms of um, considering how to proceed and considering how much deference to grant to the agencies. And um, the, the only real decision point that I'd like to raise for this meeting, and then I'll uh, clam up and we can let the commenters who've been waiting very patiently uh, say what they're gonna say. Uh, there's a suggestion made by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, sort of in, in tandem with the decision to bifurcate the comment into phase one and phase two. The suggestion was made that one benefit of that is that we could take the results of the phase one comment analysis and propose immediate uh, legislation. So instead of waiting and doing everything at once, we could also bifurcate the legislative implementation so that in phase, once we've heard all the comments on all the notes, we could draft a recommendation that makes changes in place to the existing sections without reorganizing. Um, the, the, we get the, the benefits of that is we would get the immediate and more quick uh, implementation of improvements to the code at the section level. Um, and it would also uncouple it from the organizational changes, which I think are going to take longer to reach consensus on. And uh, there are special problems that come from organization that are not necessarily going to be present from this kind of in-place 
improvements. And we already have done that to some extent. When we were building our organization, there were a couple of times where we spotted some issues where we thought, you know, this is severable and could be fixed now. And so we spun off a couple of recommendations for immediate in-place improvements and rather than holding off until the whole study was done before proposing those changes. So I, I think that, um, I think there's a lot to be said in favor of their suggestion that we make immediate use of their comments to develop an immediate like 2021 with 2022 introduction uh, proposal for improvements in place. And, and I say that that's, that's a decision I'd like to have made because I think as, as we start to work our way through their comments in future meetings, it would be good to know whether we're just going to note, you know, sort of what the commission decides about each of their comments for eventual treatment down the road of a single massive bill or whether we should be building this right now into proposed legislation. I think that's gonna change the way the staff does the work and what we present at future meetings. Because if we decide to adopt their suggested approach, then not only will be, we be reviewing their comments, but we'll also be immediately um, flipping their comments into a proposed amendment to a particular section. And so we can cumulatively build that short term in place proposal. Uh, so it would be helpful to me to know which way to go with this as we work our way through all of this stuff. Um, I think that it is likely that there's going to be quite a bit of agency resistance to massive reorganization. Um, the, I think that when this was originally launched, they hadn't yet seen the magnitude of what we were going to build and hadn't yet fully appreciated the, um, the costs to them and others of dealing with a completely reorganized code. And so it's my sense from informal conversations that the conversation we're eventually going to have about organization a year from now um, is going to be a harder conversation. And um, and then there, we may, in the interim between now and then, I've made a commitment to work with uh, stakeholders informally to hear their ideas about ways to soften the impact of reorganizational change, organizational improvement, uh, which could include a, a range of things, including like, who knows, a smaller scale targeted reorganization rather than code wide or, uh, you know, an incremental rollout, we can see. But I think that just because the deadline is going to come at the end of this year for them to comment on organization doesn't mean that we are going to be in a position to do anything on organization uh, immediately after getting that comment. I think it's going to be a, another long and difficult conversation at that point about what do we do about the proposed organization? So I, I think that that's another reason why I like the idea of uncoupling the section level improvements from the code-wide organizational changes. Um, so it's I already talked longer anymore. than I intended to. Um, the, with the chair's permission, um, I will uh, recognize, or I'll enable um, Ms. Bogdan to address us. She, I believe is a general counsel for the Department of Fish and Wildlife and I am allowing her to talk. And then also, I, if I can just say, any commissioners who need to leave, then we'll be okay. And then let's just hold over a couple of minutes beyond 12.30 if you guys are okay, okay? Is that fine? Okay, good. Um, thank, you so, uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. One of the benefits, oddly, of the pandemic is that some it actually facilitates some of this dialogue. I appreciated you noting that earlier this morning. And so it really is a pleasure to, um, to be here. I understand that we have a hard stop at 1230. Is that correct? Uh, mostly hard. I, the chair suggested that we could go over 1230 uh, with the possibility that some commissioners may need to leave. OK. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that because Angela Donlin, who's the lead attorney in our office on this project, um, 
had some words uh, to speak to just kind of go over some of the history of this um, and orient ourselves to where we are in really a decades long process. And then I also want to make sure that Chief Bess, um, who is the head of our uh, law enforcement division, has a chance to speak. So about how much time I I know your earlier items went a little bit long. I was I was listening. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have enabled all of your staff to be able to speak on unmuting themselves. And so I think it makes sense to just let you and your colleagues um, address us as you think appropriate. Uh, as the chair said, some of us at least will hang on for the duration. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I have the, we, we're not gonna call the meeting. So you guys talk, you've waited patiently. We appreciate it. That is, that is wonderful. Um, Angela, do you wanna kick it off? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Angela Donlin. And as Brian and Wendy said, I'm an attorney who uh, at the department and I've been working with the commission staff for about the last nine years on your review of the Fish and Game Code. Um, we also have here, in, in addition to Wendy, um, Chief Bess, and I, um, Julie Oldman from our Legislative Affairs Office. So hopefully, if you guys have any questions of us, we have everybody that you might need. Um, I know some of you have been here as long as this study has been going on, and others of you are a bit newer. Um, we started this process in 2010 with a legislatively required strategic planning effort. And out of that process came the legislative direction for the Law Revision Commission to make recommendations for improvements to the code. Um, the commission has responded to that legislative direction in several ways. First, with the passage of two um, code cleanup bills. In 2015, there was AB 1527, and in 2016, there was SB 1473. Uh, the commission also produced uh, several really important memos for us um, that, that looked at the department's funding and mandates. Um, you looked at the hundreds of funding provisions that are in the Fishing Game Code and developed a report that, among other things, identifies dozens and dozens of unf unfunded mandates in the Fishing Game Code for our department. That report is currently being used and is gonna continue being used as part of our service-based budgeting analysis that we're currently undertaking. Um, since then, commission staff have, they've presented additional proposals for changes to the code, um, including a 2017 proposal that addressed four divisions of the code. The recommendations that are now before the commission were proposed in 2018 and were presented in a 1300 page tentative recommendation with an additional 200 page supplement that addressed conforming changes to other codes. Over the past two years, we've worked on preparing comments on just the 500 notes as Brian described earlier. Um, and in order to do that, it involved an entire team of attorneys led by our uh, retired former general counsel, Ann Malcolm, who we brought back specifically because of her institutional knowledge um, of the Fish and Game Code. Um, in response to our review of the notes, we submitted voluminous comments to you, and we'll be working with this uh, commission staff on developing a legislative proposal. Um, that will include upwards of probably 300 additional changes to the Fishing Game Code. And naturally those changes will require subsequent amendments to probably thousands of regulations um, once the statutory amendments are complete. This latest effort alone will be the largest cleanup bill that staff can recall since the modern code was enacted in 1953. Um, I will turn it over to Wendy and Chief Best now um, so they can talk a little bit more about the department's views on the Law Revision Commission's efforts going forward and the effects that this scale of revision will have for us. Thank you, Angela, or thank you, Ms. Dalma. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. This has just been a tremendous effort by the commission and its staff. And as Brian alluded, um, as the, the process has unfolded over the last decade, CDFW has come to more fully appreciate how complex the proposed revisions are. 
um, particularly as to the organizational changes, um, which are a hard, just present unique problems in terms of review and spotting potential impacts. Um, one, one of the takeaways that the department would like to stress here today is just the ripple effect, effect associated with every individual change to language or movement within the code, or frankly, even renumbering the existing code. Uh, Angela mentioned earlier that SB 1473 from 2017 amended just 17 sections of the code and required more than 2000 corresponding regulatory changes um, under the APA. And the thing I, I wanted to take a moment just to really bring everyone's focus to is, you know, my job is overseeing the legal shop, the probably 25 different attorneys who worked on the review of the notes, who had brought their subject matter expert to work on the review of the notes and then worked with subject matter expert program staff, dozens of program staff to understand whether or not or where the changes and proposed in the notes could potentially make substantive changes in law. I'm a lawyer. As I'm doing that, I'm largely focused on you know, Cal Leg Ledge Info, my fish and game code book, the study, looking at how all of the words line out and using that as the platform for evaluating what the impact is going to be on the department, just from a legal perspective. A thing that has really come home to me throughout this process is that the impact to the department of changes really extends beyond that and in some surprising ways. Um, even where we're meeting the pragmatic approach that the commission has committed to. And there are several people, several functions within the department that have, that, that remind me of that. Chief Bess and law enforcement, I probably are my conscience in some ways throughout this that I turn to and who remind me of how changes that on their face might not have any substantive impact to the law and still have a very real world impact to our department, particularly in the urgent and um, just very immediate circumstances that parts of our department find themselves in that we lawyers <laughs> operating via Zoom just, you know, we don't, we don't experience. Um, so I'd like to just turn it over to Chief Bass as a person, um, not the only, but perhaps the best person in the department to describe how a recent change to the code provision related to sport fishing, which we initiated ourselves, just be mindful that you're not the only ones <laughs> that are, you know, endeavoring to clean up the code and the regs, you know, in, in real time, we're looking at, you know, we're, we're having due to a variety of different circumstances to look at certain sections our own or at least of the regulations. And if Chief Bess, if you could just tell us a little bit about your experience with that and also with um, the uh, proposed codification of the, of the code by the Law Revision Commission, that would be, I think, really illuminating. You bet. Thank you, Wendy. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. David Best, Chief of Law Enforcement for the Department. I think there's three points that I'd like to offer for your consideration this afternoon. First one is I'll reference the regulation simplification package that the Department undertook um, recently. For years, we've heard from constituents that uh, the regulations um, for the common layman in the field to comply with were increasingly difficult to understand and to translate to them being able to act in accordance with the law when they're out trying to fish. And we've heard this for decades. So internally inside the department, we undertook um, the effort to try to make the regulations less complex, more simple for 
folks, um, you know, out in the field that they can look at a regulation, read it, and then comply with it. We went through an exhaustive uh, program internally where we presented a regulatory package to the Fish and Game Commission, uh, where they took it and put it through an APA process and promulgated regulations that are now out and getting ready to come into, come into effect in Title 14. With any, my experience, with any of these large scale efforts that sometimes occur with the best of intentions, there's unintended consequences. And this particular package is, has not been immune to that. Um, our officers, we have 465 throughout the state of California that work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And in each of their patrol vehicles, they have a technological platform that has all the fish and game code, Title 14, everything preloaded into it so they can reference code sections or title 14 sections and make an appropriate assessment of you know what they should do relative to what they believe might be a violation of law we also use this to write citations write reports and track statistical data that um, regulation package with the best of intentions created almost 600 changes to that data platform for officers in the field that had to be changed, which means the, the, the constituency out across the landscape of the state of California has to familiarize themselves with all those, as well as do all of our officers. So my point with all that would be is just that with the best of intentions, um, I think it might be some time before we actually truly realize the benefit of simplification in that particular drill. My second point would be with relative to our prosecutorial partners across the state. Um, with sweeping changes, we also need to, in, you know, to engage with uh, the counties across the state with our uh, district attorneys, our city attorneys, the office of the attorney general. And um, we're in constant communication, but we'll have an education process relative to any landscape changes, as well as what we perceive would need to be an update um, um, a rewrite of potential jury instructions for prosecutors. And then my third and final point this afternoon would be with a large scale change, those of us who've went to the police academy and had it drilled in our brain 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, we were a requirement to graduate and get out and go to work for the department was to pretty much not all of it, but a vast majority of it was to memorize the fish and game code. Um, and subsequently the California code of regulations, specifically title 14. And a lot of that stuff, of course, over decades of work is burned into people's memories when they go to work every day with large landscape changes to that we will need to retrain officers relative to those new code sections, how those affect Title 14 and create some type of point of reference for them to be able to utilize in the field, a matrix, a reference chart, whatever that might be. My concern with that is as the chief of those officers, um, they're gonna have their head down trying to figure out what this new change means. How do you cross-reference it? What's the new citing section? Where do you go to versus having their head up, paying attention to their surroundings, their head on a swivel, and not inadvertently having an unintended consequence of creating an officer safety problem relative to their safety while they're out trying to essentially do their job and protect the resources of the state of California. And with that, I conclude and thank you again for the opportunity to comment. Thanks so much, Chief Bess. I, I really appreciate that. And to this commission, just know that it's oftentimes difficult to follow Chief Bess because when he's reporting out, it oftentimes includes like videos and stories of his officers actually picking people and hauling them out over their shoulders out of wildfires. And then I come up <laughs> and I'm the attorney like talking about, you know, I don't know, whatever. And Chief Bess's shop is putting their life on the line daily. Um, so as we approach a decade of this effort, we have been and will continue to be in conversation with the Law Revision Commission and its staff. We really appreciate the communication 
um, especially about the best uses of the use of all of our limited resources going forward. As you can imagine, you guys know probably as well as any entity um, there is, the changes to words, placements of sections, sometimes even adding a comma can have significant impacts on the meaning of the law. Uh, if the proposed revision in, it is enacted in its full, the full 1300 page uh, proposed reorganization, um, we're deeply concerned about the impacts um, to our to our operations. Um, Brian, thank you for highlighting. And I, you know, I don't want to hide the ball. And I appreciate your putting it out there that you know we are deeply concerned about the organizational challenges. Um, you, Brian, Mr. Siebert, sorry, <laughs> you have been. Um, offered, invited us to come up with some ideas on how to move forward with this effort. And um, we do think that it would be appropriate to move forward with the changes based on the notes. Um, those would result in the largest single cleanup bill to the Fish and Game Code that any of our staff can recall since it was enacted, the code was enacted in 1953. A thing I just really wanted to make sure that came through in this presentation is that that is not the first tranche of changes that have been made to the code as a result of this decades long effort. There have been several others already. Um, so I, I hope that you'll consider this as you move forward. I hope that you'll hear our appreciation for the role that you all have and your staff have. And um, you know, just know that we look forward to an open line of communication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see, I know Steve is here, but I, I would just say that I, just for the new commissioners, we have worked on this for, I didn't realize it's been since 2009. That sounds awful. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I know that I remember when, um, and we used to have, have regular uh, visits and because we met, we, not as frequently as we meet now, pretty much every quarter. And Brian, who did we have? We had a deputy. We had someone who was actually, uh, he was a, an AG or a DA oh, who had worked right. on the, or he was, he remembered. I believe he was, I believe he was a, a Department of Fish and Wildlife attorney who had been seconded to Butte County. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name. Yeah, but and he had, he recalled the initial uh, the uh, enactment of the or well the 1950s mm -hmm. change um, or codification of it. So, I mean, we had his benefit, but I will just share with you, uh, Miss Bogdan, Miss Donlin, that we that you know, and unfortunately, Chief Best too, it that we did not have a lot of input from um, others or other stakeholders, and we did you know, just the work has been enormous. And um, in pretty much every meeting, of course, Steve had to create, uh, Steve and Brian had to create uh, memos that helped us to try to figure out how to get through what changes we've made. So it is disheartening to hear that the changes um, are not welcome. We, you know, of course the intention is always, and we do agree, a comma, a period here, you see how long we spent on just moving parentheses. So, I mean, we, we do get it and we appreciate it. And I just feel the need just to mention that. Um, but I, I look forward to us partnering. I hope you continue to attend um, or add input. However, in either, you know, if it's in the form of an email, a letter, someone from your office visiting on just that portion, whatever it takes, we would appreciate it. And we appreciate you being here now and taking the time to muddle through our meeting. And we will definitely um, try to help to arrange the agenda if there are time constraints that prevent you from uh, you know, sitting in on other topics, just let us know. You can email Brian and, and we can help to arrange the agenda how it needs to be, but we wanna partner with you. I think Steve probably got tired of the commissioner saying, we haven't heard from anyone it, what else can we do to try to solicit interest or input? 
So, um, you know, again, it's, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm disheartened to hear that, you know, the, the resources, hiring someone just to study the changes after they've all been made, that, that's enormous. And um, I do hope, you know, I, I look forward to hearing what changes and, and what revisions we need to make um, on the current or the tentative recommendation. Well, and I'd like to emphasize that, you know, I do see a functional and categorical difference between the two classes of changes we've proposed that I described before, the organizational and the non-organizational. And I think that the, the suggestions that we received and acted on to, to procedurally separate those for separate discussion, I think that made a lot of sense. And and it makes sense in terms of sort of focusing everyone's efforts, but also uh, I agree with the, the suggestion from the department that it also enables us to continue to do what we have done in the past, which is roll things out incrementally and you know, sort of pick the lower hanging fruit and start to receive the benefit from that work uh, before moving on to the things that are gonna be more difficult. And, and I don't think that, I don't believe that we've, we've heard, um, you know, absolute opposition to organizational change. I think we're still waiting on that comment. And as uh, Ms. Bogdan and I have both said, we're uh, at the staff level, we're uh, anticipating partnering with each other to try and talk through like, what is compatible with, you know, achieving the best result from reorganization without uh, disabling, hamstringing, um, imposing un unreasonable burdens uh, on the department and their work. Um, so those conversations remain to be had and we will see what comes of them. Uh, I think that, you know, it's often the case that we don't get focused comment on our work until the stage where we have a tentative recommendation. That's not surprising. The tentative recommendation is sort of the signal to the world that like, okay, here's a proposal and focus on it now and give us feedback. It, the unusual thing here is it took us like six, seven years to get to the tentative recommendation stage. And so, it, it, you know, uh, once the tentative recommendation was out there, uh, I think the, the amount of work that the agencies have uh, put into reviewing it has been uh, really enormous and uh, really appreciated. And I, I think it's gonna allow us to um, make the best of what we've done to date and, and try to realize as much benefit as we can. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to actually getting into that. And that leads me back to the decision point I was hoping we could have for this meeting, which is I'll try to frame. Um, is it, does the commission agree that as, I, as we review the comments, we should do so with an eye on the possibility of uh, in place implementation of improvements as, uh, as they're reviewed and uh, recommended, as opposed to reviewing comments with an eye towards eventual introduction of a complete package that includes section level and code-wide changes. So that's a question that I'd like guidance on as I'm, I'm working on this. Good, Anna, you're back. Um, that's good. So we have a good quorum and we also have a decider. Commissioner Rick? Yeah. I think that makes sense. Um, and to, to, to bifurcate it and look at the section level stuff first and then the reorganization. Um, you may not have to do quite as extensive a reorganization if you fix some of the, or some, you, you'll be fixing some of the stuff um, rather than doing it twice. So I think, I think that makes sense. No. Does anybody see it differently? No, you have a consensus. Okay, so. Um, Victor, you agree, right? Okay. All right. Um, well, that's the guidance that I need. I Does anyone from the department Department want to say anything more? Um, it, Brian, may I just, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes, please. Oh, wonderful. Um, I just I just want to express appreciation again, and also, you know, just acknowledge that, you know, I think we over the last eight nine years, I think we have, you know, had engagement with commission staff on a number of these different efforts along the way. I, I could be wrong, um, but I. Just building off of what you said, Brian, it resonates with me that part of the challenge is when you're working on something that's so large, when you're building an elephant that's just so very large, there's a long time step to do that. And, you know, unfortunately, in that long time step to achieve the work, there's a certain amount of, you know, heads down at respective tables <laughs> to advance that work. And it's, you know, I lesson learned maybe about how to, you know, maintain connectivity um, through through that that period um, for all of us. Um, but I just I didn't want to leave this meeting feeling like it's been our impression that there has been engagement, and it is just hard when it's such a big lift. Um, and there's just necessarily a certain amount of head down, working with your pencil and your keyboard on really tricky analysis. So yeah. thank you for your consideration. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for your participating, yeah. Um, I saw you a couple other names that I think are from the Fish and Game Commission, and it's fine if you're just intending to listen to the conversation rather than make remarks, but I didn't want the, to adjourn without at least uh, giving you a chance if you'd like to say anything. I think you're referencing Melissa and Mike. Yeah, I'm not seeing hands. So um, I have what I need for the next stage and uh, I appreciate folks staying on 18 minutes past. Uh, is, does anyone have anything else they wanna say before I, I call it? You're going to call it. <laughs> no, nope, you're going to call. Move, move I, I have, to the, adjourn. I have <laughs> the power to turn it off, but you have the power to adjourn. No, that's fine. You guys, thank I'm you so much. Adjourned. Thank you, staff. Honestly, thank you, Barbara, Kristen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Steve, for all of your hard work. You guys, good reports. We didn't get to. We didn't even have enough time to thank you for the reports. But thank you, commissioners, for reading and being pre uh, prepared because you could have said what you know. That this is all good. Thanks everyone. You guys have a good month and we'll see you next time. So adjourned on my end. <laughs> okay. Goodbye everyone. Bye everyone.